2 a.m., a few miles outside the city. The car tore down the asphalt at 60 miles an hour. We kept the beams low, the dark road around us only illuminated by the occasional street lamp overhead. Things moved unseen in the trees. An old song rattled off the radio. The connection was patchy, so it was interrupted by intermittent spikes of static. It was the kind of night when you knew, deep down, that anything could happen. You just hoped that anything would be in your favor. I rolled the window down a few minutes ago, breathing in all that cold, fresh air to stave off the looming specter of sleep. Thank God I wasn't the one driving, or things would have gotten deadly way sooner. Cops would have found us with our bumper wrapped around a tree, our heads one with the steering wheel or the windshield dead on impact, or from the unforgiving cold overnight. They might have even felt sorry for us until they found the case. Perhaps it would have been better that way. At least it would have been quick. A lot of bad things can happen on lonely state highways in the dead of night, and we were about to find out that just crashing your car was one of the more mild ones. Scott was driving. He was also the one who brokered this whole deal. I was just coming along to provide backup. There was a fully loaded Saturday night special sitting in my inner coat pocket, hoping that it wouldn't see any action tonight, and a pump action shotgun sitting in the back in case things got really hairy. Deals like this, you either come well prepared, or reckon with a heavy chance you sure as hell won't be leaving. I never asked Scott how he came into the goods currently sitting in the briefcase, and he never offered an explanation either. He only told me that he'd already secured a very interested potential buyer from a syndicate out of town. Serious people. Dangerous people. They'd pay top dollar, or leave us tied up in trash bags in a ditch off the side of the highway. But we both needed money, and we were willing to take that risk if it meant we could return from this deal as a pair of rich men. The terms of the deal were simple. We drive out onto a certain state highway at a little after 2 a.m. with the goods, meet the buyers at a certain rest stop along the way, and make the exchange. We'd then all go our separate ways, and if we were lucky, none of us would ever see each other ever again. Seemed simple enough, sure. Scott seemed downright chipper about the whole thing. And for a little while, I was excited too, until he told me about the road that the buyers wanted to meet us on. We'd all heard legends about the place. Superstitions, really. People think criminals are scary, but believe me, we're a surprisingly superstitious bunch. Our profession is one largely based on luck. Being in the right place at the right time, and being lucky enough to avoid the cops along the way. But something you need to know, whether you're a criminal or arrow straight, is that some places are always going to be the wrong place. I'm not gonna tell you which road it is. I know what you knuckleheads are like. You're curious. You're thrill seekers. Hey, we were all young once, but if I tell you what this road is, I know you're gonna try to find it. Maybe you'll even decide it's worth the trip down for a pleasant Sunday drive. <laughs> After what I went through on that road, I wouldn't wish a trip down it on my worst enemy. There's no other word for what we encountered there other than evil. When we were kids, we used to call it the Devil's Passage. Every spooky rumor and scary story in the book circulated about that place. Let me see what I can remember. Well, there was the Watcher in the Woods. People used to say that there was a long, tall figure with the biggest eyes you had ever seen. Eyes like headlights, standing amongst the trees. If the moonlight shone in the right angle as you were driving past, you'd see it standing there, just staring at you, thinking about doing who knows what. Then there was old Beth, the ghostly hitchhiker. People used to say they saw a strange old woman hobbling down the side of the road in the middle of the night. Sometimes people said that they could hear her crying, even if they were far enough away to make such a thing seem impossible. If you took pity on her and pulled over, asking her if she needed a ride, she'd tell you that you were a very kind person, but that she was fine and dandy walking along by herself. But if you didn't stop and offer her a lift, if you just drove away, well, local legend had it that the next time you'd see her face would be in your rearview mirror as she sat in your back seat, reaching for you with her ancient bony claws. It'd make you think twice about leaving an old woman to walk home alone in the dark. And, of course, there was the lone jogger. The stories my dad told me about him always used to scare the hell out of me. He was a pale man, dressed unnaturally light for the cold winter months, jogging along the side of the road. If you looked at him, he'd look back. If your eyes ever met, the stories went that he'd start running after you. It wouldn't matter how fast you drove, he'd somehow always catch up and stare at you through the glass of your car's windows. He never hurt anyone directly, but I imagine he probably caused a heart attack or two in his time, if he ever really existed. But all of these things were nothing, I repeat, nothing, 
compared to the Phantom Cruiser. You have to drive cautiously at night, because if you didn't, you might find a ghostly 1970s police cruiser tailgating you, and that'd be the worst thing you ever saw. There were fewer stories about this one than all the others, because if you ever ran afoul of the Phantom Cruiser, chances are that you wouldn't survive to tell people about what happened to you. Though people could still make an educated guess about what happened to you based on whatever was left behind. Here's a not so fun fact. The Devil's Passage is technically qualified for one of the most dangerous highways in the country. From crashes to hitchhiker murders to unexplained deaths on the side of the road. Since 1974, this road has been an incredibly unpleasant place to drive. Every time I saw another horror story about a strange death on the road, I'd think of the Phantom Cruiser and it was those same thoughts polluting my brain that night. As Scott drove the two of us to the rest stop halfway down the Devil's Passage, I only realized I'd dozed off when he nudged me awake, and the blurry lights of distant street lamps flashed into my field of vision. Look alive, he said. We're here. The rest stop wasn't much to look at. All that there was was an abandoned gas station, really the perfect place for this kind of illicit deal. My hand moved instinctively to the special in my coat and clicked back the hammer. Something about this whole setup wasn't right. Sting operation? Police ambush? This whole thing reeked of a deal too good to be true. My instincts turned out to be right, in a sense, just not the way I was expecting. As we turned into the rest stop, Scott turned up his beams. All we saw was carnage waiting for us. A car, presumably one that once belonged to our prospective buyers, in a state of horrific disarray. It looked as though a train had impacted the side of the vehicle, completely caving it in. The metal was covered in deep scratches and ruts that almost looked like claw marks. It had been eviscerated. Scott broke hard, and we both got out of the car. I drew the special out of my jacket, and he grabbed the shotgun out of the back seat. We approached with caution, worrying this might just be another part of the setup, until we saw the thick puddle of blood congealing under the driver's side door. We drew closer, propelled by morbid curiosity. Was it a hit from a rival gang looking to intercept the deal? It seemed logical, but there were no bullet holes in the car just ripping, tearing, and massive impact damage. Scott shined the light of his phone into the destroyed car, and I vomited when I saw what was inside. The buyers looked less like people, and more like two sacks of pulled pork in tattered clothes. If I hadn't seen them inside the car, I wouldn't have even guessed they were human, and the damage wasn't just to them. The upholstery was torn up and burned, with violent symbols carved into the walls and scrawled onto the cracked windows in blood. When I turned to Scott, he was ghost white, clutching his phone and shotgun with trembling hands. We didn't exchange a word, but we both knew it was time to leave. We could find another buyer. There'd be other opportunities, other deals. But lives? You only get one. And we both silently acknowledged that if we stuck around here much longer, we wouldn't even have that. We sped back into the car and locked the doors behind us, for whatever good that would do, considering the damage that had been done to the buyers and their car. Perhaps we just needed the illusion of security to get us the hell out of there. The car pulled out of the rest stop at breakneck speed. Scott floored it, trying to put some good distance between us and the horror at that rest stop. Whatever had happened to the buyers, we didn't fancy sharing that same awful fate. My heart dropped down to my guts when I heard the sirens and flashing lights behind us. After all this, we'd been busted for speeding. They'd pull us over and find the guns and the briefcase in the car, and they'd have a lot of questions that neither of us would have good answers to. We didn't know whether to slow down and hope for the best, or speed up and take this boy in blue on a genuine car chase. This whole thing couldn't have gone more wrong. But my thoughts soon drifted from getting used to the taste of prison food to something altogether more sinister. When I saw the car getting closer in the rearview mirror, I realized that this wasn't a modern cop car tailing us. It was a beat-up old 70s cruiser, traveling at insane speeds, gaining on us. The high beams cut through me like razor blades. I heard the radio crackle into life, even though neither I nor Scott touched it. It wasn't music, just a hoarse, scratchy voice repeating the word, RUN, again and again. And seeing as whatever was behind us clearly wasn't a real cop, we were more than happy to oblige that request. Scott hit the gas like our lives depended on it, which, to be fair, they did. But no matter how fast we sped up, the cruiser kept getting closer, like a demon on our tail. I screamed at Scott to go faster, but we were going as fast as we could. Next thing I knew, the Phantom Cruiser collided with the backside of our car and sent us into a spin, showering the two of us with broken glass crystals as the tires screeched across the asphalt. It felt like an eternity before the car came to a rest, and at that moment, the Phantom Cruiser stopped too. Someone got out. 
He was dressed like a cop, he even looked like a cop. A dude in his 40s, balding, overweight, with a handlebar mustache. But something was wrong about him. He didn't say a word as he approached the car, and he didn't seem to register me sliding the special out of my jacket either. He was inches away from Scott's window when I panicked and opened fire, sending a hail of small caliber rounds into his gut. He stumbled back slightly, as though shocked, and then everything got a whole lot worse. The cop let out the most awful bellow, not of pain, but of pure rage. Something happened to his face. His eyes started to glow a bright, hellish red, and his jaw began to extend until he looked like a munch painting. There were no teeth in there, just an infinite black void. He grabbed a dazed Scott through the window, pulling him into a brutal headlock and dragging him out of the car, releasing those deranged bellows the entire time. Scott screamed and pleaded for help. I grabbed his body and tried to pull him back, but the cop was inhumanly strong. He just kept pulling until he was all the way out, thrashing on the asphalt. I, I, I don't want to tell you what he did next. Wouldn't be right. But suffice to say, I couldn't save Scott. And I definitely didn't want it happening to me. While he was working on Scott, I scrambled into the driver's seat and floored it, hoping that Scott would at least buy me some time. I was weeping in terror as I drove away into the dark, leaving my friend to a horrible fate with the driver of the Phantom Cruiser. So you can only imagine how I felt when a few minutes later, I heard the sirens again and saw the bright lights getting closer behind me. Run, run, run. Now go check out SCP-002 The Living Room and the Most Terrifying SCP Rooms, and The Secret at the Bottom of SCP-087 Explained for more SCP videos that'll give you nightmares.